Good morning and welcome to this service of worship offered to you this day by the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Wallingford, Connecticut. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm the Reverend Kathy Cunliffe and I'm the senior minister at the church and along with my worship colleague, Dr. Jeanette Gross, our minister of music and today's liturgist, Kathy Knight. We are so glad to have you here with us this morning. Whether you're worshiping with us, watching via our Zoom platform or our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, or perhaps you're viewing us on our local access station, WPAA, uh, 3.30 p.m. on Sunday afternoons. Whatever it is and wherever it is that you are joining us, we hope that you'll feel a warm welcome here among us and that our time together will be one of renewal and inspiration for your days and weeks to come. We long to be a place of loving communication and mutual support and care, and we hope that you will feel that as we spend this time in worship together. Today we begin a new worship series that we'll be exploring for the next many weeks. It's titled, Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. And it's certainly a relevant theme for our time but it also may seem at first glance a bit of a negative perspective. You might be asking yourself, why in all this chaos and confusion and anxiety do we want to focus our attention on unraveling? Well, please stick with us because I promise that it will be a meaningful theme to explore. We will not only consider the reality of things that feel as if they are unraveling in our time, the realities of life itself. But we will also be considering how God is present and active in the midst of these times. Sometimes some things take unraveling or undoing before they can fully become or fully be what they are to be. So come along with us for some important and impactful stories from the Bible that will help us explore in prayer and in beautiful music and wonderful imagery, in silence and in word. God meets us in the spiraling, unraveling our plans and us into something new. So let us come now into this threshold moment as we draw near to God with this centering music. Thank you. 
Hear now these words. As we open ourselves to the presence of God in this moment. Let your God love you. Be silent, be still, alone in thought. Empty yourself before your God. Say nothing, ask nothing. Be silent, be still. Let your God look upon you. That is all. For God knows. God understands. God loves you with an enormous love and only wants to look upon you with that love. Quiet, still, be. Let your God love you. Amen. Please join me as we pause with intention for a moment of silent reflection and personal confession. We do this not in a shameful way, but because we believe that when we come before God with our deepest prayers and personal trials, God is willing to forgive us and transform our lives. Let us come before God in the quiet. Prayer of Confession. Gracious God, Zacchaeus valued money over people and power over equality. He was a sinner, and we confess, so are we. Like Zacchaeus, we are quick to prioritize the wrong things, valuing our to-do lists over family time, our own success over a relationship with you, our Creator, and wealth over generosity. We lose sight of what really matters. We lose sight of love. Forgive us for our ignorance and impatience. Call us back to the life you long for us to lead and transform us with your grace. 
and humility and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear now these words of assurance. Whether we are aware or not, God has always loved us. And so even into this time when it seems as if all around us, everything is unraveling, it is into such a time that God's healing and forgiveness breaks forth. And so rejoice and know yourself as healed and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. God's Story, Zacchaeus. So part of God's story is about Zacchaeus, and it begins like this. Once there was a man named Zacchaeus, let's call him Zac, who lived in a town called Jericho. He was short, and he didn't have many friends. In fact, most people hated Zac. That's because he worked as a tax collector. See, back then people paid taxes, just like now. But instead of sending money to the government, there were men in every city whose job was taking tax money from people. Problem is, those men usually lied. Zach, like most, took a lot of extra money from a lot of people. And all those people hated him. Anyway, one day Jesus came to Zach's town, and Zach wanted to see him. But so did everybody else. And remember how Zach was really short? Well, he couldn't see Jesus over everybody else's head. So guess what he did? He actually climbed up into a tree to look out over everybody. Now, imagine a grown man climbing up in a tree in the middle of a crowd. People probably thought he was crazy or weird, but Zach was willing to look weird if it meant getting closer to Jesus. From up in the tree, Zach watched as Jesus walked up. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. This was kind of like a famous person inviting themselves over, except way better. This invitation would change Zach's life. Zach scrambled down the tree to take Jesus to his house. Maybe he thought Jesus didn't know about all the money he had taken or how everybody hated him. But Jesus did know, and he loved Zach anyways. Other people saw this and they were mad. They said, Jesus has gone into the house of a sinner. They wondered how Jesus could love somebody who had lied and stole their money. The great thing is, Jesus loves all of us, even after we've done things we deserve to get in trouble for, or even after we actually get in trouble. When we see that Jesus loves us anyway, it makes us want to show that kind of love to others. At least that's what happened to Zach. Right away, he wanted to make things right with the people he had hurt. He knew that just saying I'm sorry wasn't enough. So he told Jesus, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor, and anyone I cheated, I will pay back four times the amount of money I took. When Jesus saw that Zach was willing to accept his love and turn around and show it to others, he said, my friend, today God has rescued you. And even though Zach had been a liar and a thief who was hated by everyone, he became a friend of Jesus and a part of God's family that very day. And that's the story of Zacchaeus. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Zach was short. He was a tax collector. He stole money. People hated him. Jesus came to town. Zach couldn't see him. He climbed a tree. Jesus told him to come down. Jesus went to his house. Jesus loved Zach. Others were mad. Zach made things right. He became a part of God's family. And that's a part of God's story. Our first text from Holy Scripture is a reading of Psalm 119, verses 137 through 144. Psalm 119 is one of the acrostic poems in the Bible. Each of its 176 verses are divided into 22 stanzas, and each stanza begins with one of the 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet. It is the longest psalm in the Bible. In our verses today, the psalmist names the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of human beings, and makes a plea for the wisdom that will give new life. Hear now the words of the psalmist. You are righteous, O Lord, and your judgments are right. You have appointed your decrees in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. 
I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have come upon me, but your commandments are my delight. Your decrees are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Our second reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke in the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Here we have the story of the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus, the tax collector who has come to catch a glimpse of Jesus as he enters into Jericho and ends up with a life transformed as a result. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. May God bless to our hearts and to our understanding today's readings from God's Holy Word. I invite you to join me now in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you are our loving spirit, and we ask that that spirit presence might join us now in this moment, that as we listen for your word, as we speak the truth of humanity and our frailty, as we speak the challenges of this life and the ways that you are there to help us transform into all that we can be. We pray that you will be with us now and end these days as we journey ahead. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, in biblical times, tax collectors you're probably familiar with them in various scripture texts. They were the persons who were responsible for collecting the tolls and taxes on behalf of the Roman government. And in areas ruled by the Roman Empire, contracts for collecting taxes in a region were farmed out, usually first to wealthy foreigners, and then these persons in turn hired local inhabitants to collect the taxes, such as the character in our gospel text today, Zacchaeus. He is a chief tax collector in Jericho. And such individuals would then rely on lower level tax gatherers. These were often slaves to do the actual work of collecting the monies. Now this might involve, for example, examining goods that were being transported along the roads and then assessing tolls accordingly. It could also be goods sold in certain markets that were also subject to taxes. And the tax collectors were responsible for paying the government the revenue that they had promised in obtaining their contract. But they were generally then free to collect additional taxes from the people in order that they might make a profit. This 
gave great opportunity for theft, fraud, and corruption, which abounded. And tax collectors are often portrayed negatively throughout much of Greco-Roman literature. So thus, we will often hear the phrase in the New Testament, tax collectors and sinners. They're often cited together as examples of undesirable types. So it is in a surprising reversal of norms that Jesus is often heard lauding tax collectors, prostitutes, and other marginalized individuals over those who were in prominence in the communities of his time. And Jesus is also sharply criticized by associating with tax collectors. And of course, he is even reported to have collect a tax collector as one of his disciples, Matthew. So in our passage today, we hear of Jesus's arrival into Jericho, that many had gathered to see him come, to await his passing by. And one of those was a man named Zacchaeus. And we've heard in our scripture text today and in our children's message that he was a chief tax collector and quite wealthy. And he had heard about this Jesus. There was many other ways that the word would have gotten out across the land because Jesus was in the vicinity teaching and sharing messages that were once again against the cultural norms of the time. So these encounters would have caught attention and the word would have spread. And so he's, you know, short of stature and trying to see Jesus and realizes that the only way he's going to get a vantage point is to climb up into a sycamore tree. And there amongst the crowd, not really standing out at all, perhaps even off in the distance in a bit of an obscure way, it's Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who catches Jesus's eye. And he invites Zacchaeus down from the tree and invites him to offer Jesus hospitality in his very own home. And so, of course, Zacchaeus is um, amazed by this invitation and climbs down the tree. And it is a moment of transformation for him in his life. Someone so reviled by others. And we hear of his promise of generosity as a result, as if in that moment of encounter with Jesus, everything is changed. Here in the story, a tax collector. A critique of one short in stature, not necessarily a critique of his size, perhaps, but naming him in the imagery that comes to mind as a small person, a person who is small and petty in life because of the vocation he had chosen and all of the corruption that went along with it. He's the one who takes the money of those who are the most lowly in society and uses it to benefit not only himself, but those at the top of the social circles. When he enters a room, he knows himself to be not welcome or wanted by most. He knows himself to be a reviled person amidst his peers. Friends, here in this story, there are actually many unravelings. Jesus flips the expectations upside down by inviting the most reviled person to offer him hospitality in his own home. And he doesn't do this in a whisper or by pulling Zacchaeus off to the side. No, he shouts it to him up there in the tree. 
He does this very publicly because this isn't just about Zacchaeus and his transformation. It's also about the unraveling of the crowd's expectations, for they deem Zacchaeus a sinner and unworthy of such attention, especially from the likes of Jesus. But Jesus unravels their world order, and in so doing, in that very public moment, teaches them a new way. Zacchaeus is invited into community. Jesus invites him, one most reviled, to belong. I wonder if Zacchaeus ever felt that way before, or how long it had been since he had. Perhaps with his vocation, it had been a long, long time. So you can only imagine the transformational possibilities in that moment, the flip of a switch. And in response to such welcome, invitation, and belonging, Zacchaeus responds generously. He knows of his wrongs, and he promises not only to share his resources more equitably in the future, but he vows something even further to repay those that he defrauded, not the usual customary one-fifth of someone in Jewish culture who would have perhaps borrowed or loaned money from someone, but four times. He promises Jesus he will repay those he defrauded four times more than what he originally took. So what is the significance here in all of this unraveling? Professor of Preaching Fred Craddock puts it this way. Here in the case of Zacchaeus, his being saved refers to a conversion to be sure, but certainly not one in any private sense. Not only is his household involved, but also the poor who will be beneficiaries of his conversion, as well as those people whom he may have defrauded. His salvation, therefore, has personal, domestic, social, and economic dimensions. In addition, we should not forget that in the other stories of Scripture, saved is often translated made well or healed, or made whole. Craddock goes on, Luke, the physician, would object to confining the word saved to simply a condition of the soul. In fact, the whole of life is affected by Jesus's ministry, and this a foretaste of the complete reign of God. A little man climbs a tree for a better view and ends up with unraveling into a new vocation and a new identity. A crowd holds tight to their beliefs about how things are supposed to work, even to the point of their own anger when someone is treated in a way they think he should not but in their witness to an unraveling before their eyes, they are taught a whole new way of being community. In this story of who is and who isn't worthy in the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of God, Zacchaeus shows us the holy and joyful unraveling possibilities with the love of God at the center. Amen. Many 
As we come into the time where we share in our pastoral prayer, we begin with a prayer by Martin Wallace from his book, City Prayers. It is called Behind Each Door. And then we continue into the prayers of our own hearts. Let us pray. As you and I walk down the terraced street, where all the houses seem to be from a common mold, and each door looks the same, it would be easy to be mistaken and assume that those inside each house are from a common mold. You and I know, Lord, that each household has a different story of happiness, heartache, and health, wealth, weariness, and worry, sadness, solitude, and sickness, energy, encouragement, and excitement. I see biblical pictures of villages with square white houses all the same, when the same assumption could be made. Yet you, O oh Lord, cut through all of that and treated 
everyone the same but differently. Follow, return, give away, be reborn, tell everyone, keep silent. Keep me alive, O oh Lord, to the special uniqueness behind each door. O oh God of the trees and pathways, you stand ready for us to gaze in your direction. Just as Jesus walked down the Jericho path, observing Zacchaeus, help us to remember that you are continually present to us, watching and guiding our steps. When we falter, you pick us up, dust us off, and place us back on the path. When we run in directions that are harmful, you are ready to rescue and redeem us. When we shout our disbelief, you offer to us your love and you are ready to receive us. Today, as we gather in this time of worship, help us to remember that we are a small part of a long line of witnesses to your love and your care those who have paved the way for us, just as we now pave the way for others. And so, O oh God, give us courage and the strength we need to serve you in all that we do. Remind us again that you are not looking for us to be perfect before we come to you, for you will take our rough edges and make them smooth. You will find the sparkling gem in the rough stone. You will help us in our unraveling to learn to surrender to your power and serve as witness to the lives that are changed that will never be the same. O oh Lord, be with all those from our community of faith that we call to mind in this moment and every other loved one on our hearts and minds this day. May they each know of your support and your loving care. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me now as we share together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During these challenging times, as the church continues to seek ways to be vital and relevant, even in very different ways, we are greatly encouraged by your generosity. Our ministries continue, and in fact, as our program year launches, we are in discussions and meetings about how we may be able to continue to offer spiritual nurture, worship opportunities, and other means of sharing in the life of faith even during this COVID virus time. We appreciate your generosity and continuing to support the ministries of this church. And we thank each and every one of you. In this moment, we are offered the opportunity to share an expression, a gesture, or some words that offer to one another the peace of Christ. Feel free to do so via our chat boxes or comment section or with those that you are gathered with worshiping together this day. Let us now share with one another some sign of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, my friends. 
Peace be with you. Grace and peace, everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Grace and peace to you. Peace be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Grace and peace to each of you. Peace, peace be, be with you. you. It has truly been a joy to have you with us this morning. I hope the time that we have spent together has been meaningful for you and will help carry you with courage and strength and renewal into this coming week. So hear now these words of benediction as you go. Do not be afraid to seek out Jesus. Even if in some way doing so may cause an unraveling in your life for who knows friends where that may lead and then be a witness to that love that you have known go now in peace knowing that god's hope peace and love go with you amen <laughs>